I hope you're ready for the word this morning. We have arrived at Romans chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn with me to the book of Romans, which comes after Acts. We have the four Gospels, the book of Acts, and then the book of Romans. And today we're going to be in Romans chapter 6. We're going to try our best to cover 14 verses, verses 1 to verses 14. In a sermon that I'm entitling, Freedom from Sin Through Union with Christ. Freedom from Sin Through Union with Christ. Romans 6, 1 to 14. Here is my outline. Here is how I've divided the passage. Number one, Paul addresses an argument. And the argument that he's addressing is antinomianism. And I'm going to explain that in a little while. So he addresses an argument. The argument that he's addressing is antinomianism. Number two, Paul presents an apologia, which means a defense, an explanation, some reasoning. We get our Christian word apologetics from that word. He gives an explanation. And the main thought when he gives this explanation, the main thrust is amalgamation, which is oneness, which is union which is coming together, a merger, and that union is with Christ. Finally, in number three, Paul gives us some practical application. And the main thought in that application is adaptation. So an argument, antinomianism, apologia, amalgamation, application, adaptation. So let's begin with the first point this morning, the argument that Paul addresses, which is, antinomianism. When Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, to all the believers in Rome, and he was writing to the believers, not to a specific church, he's writing to all the believers in Rome, we have to keep in mind that there were no chapters, there were no verse divisions. It was just one long letter. And there was no opportunity to go back and forth. So they were, the, the letter would just be read aloud to the believers, and they, they couldn't clarify their doubts, they couldn't raise any objections, they couldn't say, no, 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 I have a problem with that truth that you int introduced, I have a doubt that I have, if I have a question, they just have to listen to it, and so Paul, as he's writing to them, has to foresee certain objections that might be raised, certain questions or doubts that the receivers might have. And over here in chapter 6 verses 1, he addresses an argument that he foresees. In order to understand the argument that he foresees, we have to go back to the second last verse of chapter 5, chapter 5 verses 20, a truth that we all greatly rejoiced in last week. We said, where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. That's what we learned, where sin increases, Grace literally superabounded. And so we rejoiced in that truth. We said, wherever I have sin in my life, God's grace has this amazing capacity to come and cover it, to overwhelm it, to overflood it. And we rejoice. But then some people start thinking, oh, if that's the case, if God always has grace for my sins, then why don't I live a lifestyle of sin? Why don't I continue to sin? Why don't I live in perpetual sin and besetting sin so that God's grace might increase, might look even more glorious? Why don't I live in sin so that I accentuate the grace of God? Why don't I highlight the grace of God so that others can see that God is so abounding in love, so gracious, so slow to anger? Some people raise this objection. Why don't I live in continual sin? And this is one of the main accusations against modern Christianity. Many people from the outside looking in say that in Christianity they say that they're saved by grace. And so they're encouraging sin. They're saying that you can't do anything to earn your salvation. At least we in our faith with our beliefs say you try as hard as possible. You do as many good deeds as possible. Try to secure your salvation. But in Christianity they're teaching you're saved by grace. You can live any way you please. That is one of the greatest accusations against modern Christianity. Of course that is a gross misrepresentation of what grace really means. In other words, those people believe that we Christians say that we can live like hell and go to heaven. We can live like hell and go to 
heaven. But it's not just from the outside, and even within Christendom, there's this very divisive topic about whether a genuine Christian can lose their salvation. And I'm sure that even in this church, there are people on either sides in both those camps. Some people will say, yes, you can lose your salvation. Look at the warning passages. Some people will say, no, you can never lose your salvation. Look at all those security passages, eternal life. And so the people who believe that you can lose your salvation will accuse the people who say that you can never lose your salvation, saying, you're teaching a dangerous doctrine. Why? Why are you teaching a dangerous doctrine? Because you're assuring people that they will never lose their salvation. They can go and live any way they please. They'll say, I made a profession 20 years ago. I, I, you know, I, I, I went, I came down and in, during the altar call, I came and I gave my life. And then they go out and live their life any way they please. It's a dangerous doctrine. I would ask people who say that to consider Romans chapter 6 and what Paul says over here. In Romans 6, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we all continue to sin so that grace may abound? Look at his response in verses 2a, the first part of verses 2. He says, by no means. In the Greek, it's an emphatic response. It's the strongest repudiation that you can find in the Greek language. In modern vernacular, it would be something like saying, no way, Jose, never. Literally, it means perish the thought. Forget about it. That's ridiculous. How can you even think of something like that? Have you lost your mind? If Paul was writing in Tamil, he would have said, Pai kya ma. If he was writing in Hindi, he would have said, Bhadal hai kya? So he said, by no means, never. You perish the thought of continuing to live in sin so that grace may abound. Because that is grace being misused. That is grace being misused. That's not the purpose of grace. Now hold that thought. Grace being misused. A couple of weeks ago, you probably have heard about the shooting in Texas, in the state of Texas. Those gunmen went on a, on a rampage and he took down many people, many civilians. Many civilians lost their life. During that time, my father was also in Texas, and he happened to be just three blocks away from the shooting. And he said that all these helicopters came and they were announcing over the loudspeaker, stay indoors, everybody stay indoors. So my father at that time was hiding in a church with some others, and they were all waiting for the situation to be brought under control. When the situation was brought under control, they were all able to return to their respective places. And as my father was going back to the place in which he was staying, he was telling his host, who was obviously a little bit shaken, and he was telling his host, I don't understand why civilians have to carry guns. Okay, if the police carry guns, it's, oh, it's fine. Army, fine. But why, do the, why does the common man have to carry such dangerous weapons that can cause so much damage? I don't understand your gun laws. And as he was saying that, his host said, I also have two guns in my house. I also carry an AR-15 and a pistol and it's there at home. And he explained and he said, because it's lawful, because it's legal, because we want to exercise our rights. And here in the state of Texas, you have something called open carry. You can get an open carry permit and you can carry your gun around openly. You can just put it in your holster or your waistband and you can walk around. And he said it empowers us. It makes us feel safe. It makes us feel secure. It's for our protection. It's for our self-defense. It empowers us. In the hands of a responsible law-abiding citizen, it does empower them. It does provide them with safety. They can feel secure. But what happens if that same gun is in the hands of a lunatic? What happens if that person goes around in a killing spree, claiming the lives of many people? Then it's a weapon of mass murder. Then it causes terrible destruction, a lot of pain and loss. That's how grace is. In the hands of the right person, the person who understands the purpose of grace, grace is a powerful weapon when it comes to thwarting the schemes of the devil. It's a powerful weapon. It empowers us. It keeps us safe and secure. But in the hands of somebody who's not thinking rightly, who thinks, oh, I've been given grace so I can sin more, no? Because God's giving me more and more grace. Let me continue to sin so that grace will abound. The apostle says, by no means. Let's go to point number two, which is the apologia. The apologia is the defense 
or the explanation that Paul gives, and his main thought here is amalgamation. Now, it begins in verses 2a and it goes up right to verse, uh, sorry, 2b, so the second half of verses 2, and it goes up right to verse 10. But I just want to give you Paul's thought over here. What is his logical sequence over here? And you only get his logical sequence when you come from the bottom up. If you're reading from verses 2b right up to verses 10, you might be wondering what is his main thought. But here it is, if you're coming from verses 10 onwards, this is how it, it will sound. Premise number one is, Christ died to sin. That, that verse is there, it becomes explicit in verse number 10. Christ died to sin. Premise number two is, we died with Christ. That's the amalgamation part. That's our union. We died with Christ in verses 3 to 7. That becomes obvious. Therefore, premise number three, the conclusion is, we died to sin. Christ died to sin. We died with Christ. Therefore, we died to sin. That is Paul's main thought over here between verses 2b and verses 10. But I'm not going to go from the bottom up. We'll start with verses 2b. Let me read it out for you. Yeah, it's up on the screen. Verses 2b says, How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Paul is describing this rescuing, this deliverance, or this transfer, which is so radical, it's so decisive, it's so final, it's so permanent, that he decides to employ the language of life and death. He says, how can we, who have died to sin, still live in it any longer? There's a famous story told about Augustine. And Augustine said, uh, he was the Bishop of Hippo. He lived a terrible life before he was converted. He was, he was living with a prostitute before he got radically saved. And after he got wonderfully converted, one day he was walking down the streets in northern Africa when the prostitute saw that it was Augustine. And she called out to him, Augustine, Augustine. And it was, he ignored her. It was like he had the blinders on and he was just walking straight without paying attention to the prostitute. She came a little closer and she yelled, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. And then Augustine, without missing a beat, looked at her and said, I know, I know, but it is not I. In other words, he was saying, I have turned over a new leaf. The old is gone, the new is here. I have a new creation in Christ. How can we, who have died to sin, still live in it any longer, says Apostle Paul. And then in verse 3, he says, do you not know? Now some of us, you can see it over here, if we're being honest, we might have to respond saying, no, actually, I don't know what you're going to say. I've actually never really thought about what you're saying here to the Apostle Paul. But after today, you can answer this question saying, I do know now, I do know what you mean by this union with Christ, this amalgamation. In verses 3, the Apostle Paul says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, you can, you can to add some clarity, you can say baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? The word baptized is a transliteration. It's not a translation. So in the Greek, the word is baptized when, when you spell it out in English, it is baptized. There are many other examples like that in the New Testament. For example, the word Amen. Whenever Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, or very, very, I say unto you, he's saying, Amen, Amen, I say unto you. Another example would be the word for angel, which is the Greek word angelos. It's just a transliteration. Angelos, angel. Another example, apostle, apostolos. All transliterations. Another example would be Satanas, Satan. Blasphemy, blaspheme. So all these are transliterations. And so this word baptized is a transliteration. It's not a translation. In English, it means to immerse, to cover completely. So if I take a, a garment, a piece of cloth, and I uh, immerse it in dye, then that shirt or that pant or that garment is baptized. If I take a mug, and I put it in a bucket, of, we all know what a mug is here in India, unless you're very posh and you have only showers. You know what a mug is? A mug is baptized in a bucket of water. That's the, that's the answer. When it's covered fully, when it's submerged completely. And so what is Paul saying here? 
we have been baptized, we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized, immersed into his death. Now, as you study the New Testament, that word baptism, that word immersion can be used in, in, in many settings. For example, there's something called the baptism of Moses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 to 3. We're told about the baptism of Moses that the Israelites were baptized in the baptism of Moses and it basically means that they were immersed or they submitted to the leadership of Moses in the Red Sea and through the cloud. So they were identifying with Moses. They were immer immersed in Moses' leadership. That's the baptism of Moses. Then you have the baptism of John the Baptist. John the baptizer, John the immerser mentioned in Mark chapter 1 verses 4. It was a baptism of water. It was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And John the Baptist talks about Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3 verses 11. He says, there's one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you, number one, with the Holy Spirit. So there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe, happens when a person becomes a believer in accordance to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which says, we've all been baptized into one spirit, by one spirit. We've all been, sorry, we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. Regardless of whether you're Jew or Gentile, we all drink of the same spirit. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit it happens when a person is converted or is regenerated and given a new heart. But John the Baptist also mentions a second kind of baptism. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. fire. So many people think that fire is synonymous with the Holy Spirit. And it's true that the fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but not in this context. In this context, if you just read the next verse, Matthew 3.12, you quickly understand that fire is a baptism of judgment. It's a baptism of judgment to come. And another clue is Acts chapter 1 verses 5 where Jesus tells the disciples when they're waiting for the Holy Spirit, he says John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, but he leaves out the fire. Why? The disciples are not going to be baptized with fire. They're going to only be uh, baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then you have another baptism, the actual baptism of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3 verses 13 to 17 talks about Jesus coming to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is hesitant and Jesus says it's okay, it is fitting, it is proper to fulfill all righteousness. So let's get this done with. And then the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. And you hear God's voice saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. That's the baptism of Jesus. Then you have another kind of baptism in Mark chapter 10 verses 38, which is the baptism of suffering. The baptism of the cross. James and John come to Jesus and say, do you want to sit on, on the right side or on the left side when you're seated on your throne? Jesus asked them, are you able to drink from the cup that I'm about to drink? And are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? That is the baptism of the cross, the baptism of suffering. And then finally, you have what is called as believer's baptism or water baptism, which is which is what I believe is mentioned here in Romans 6 3. I believe that this is a picture of water baptism. Now, some scholars will disagree and they will say this is a dry verse. This is not talking about water baptism. This is just talking about your incorporation into the body of Christ. They're just metaphorically talking that you're immersed into uh, the body of Christ. Some people say this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I believe because that the Bible, because the Bible never contemplates a gap between becoming a believer and the baptism in Acts, everybody gets baptized immediately, like the Ethiopian eunuch by Philip or the house of Cornelius. When they believe, they get baptized. That's why Peter, after giving his important sermon in Acts chapter 2, that eloquent sermon, after 3,000 people are cut to the heart, he says, repent and be baptized. They ask him, what should we do? In Acts 2.38, he says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All in one shot he talks about it. All like one event. And so I believe that over here Paul is referring to water baptism because the people, the audience in Rome would have understood this term to mean water baptism. It became a technical term by the time the epistle to the Romans was written. And so I believe that this is water baptism. All those other things may be true but the primary picture here is water baptism and he's saying you have been united or baptized or immersed with, with Jesus into his death. Now there's another question that maybe some of you will be interested in. I don't know if everybody's interested in this question, but the question is this. When did I die with Christ? It says, I've been baptized into his death. 
when did that happen? The text seems to indicate that that happened because of something called the air is passive verbs. It says it's an event in the past. But then if you look at verses 6, I'm going ahead a little bit just to show us something. If you look at verses 6, it says, we know that our old self was crucified with him. So when did I die? When I was crucified with him on the cross. And then if you look at verses 10, it says he died once to sin. So when did I die with him? When am I united with him? With him when he died on the cross circa 30 AD. But we also can understand that because we are coming right after last week's teaching, which where we saw that we all sinned in Adam. He was our federal head. He was our representative. So now when we talk like this, that we died when Jesus died on the cross, it makes sense because he's our federal head. He's the second Adam. He's the last Adam. And he represents all those who will potentially believe in him and in his cross and in his death and in his sacrifice. But then somebody who's a careful observer might look at the passage and say, but it also seems to be pointing to the fact, especially in, in verses like verse, I mean, verse 3, verse 4, it, it talks about it like as if it's in the present tense. Like as if it's common to a believer's experience. In his lifetime, he really experiences this death. And I believe that both are true. Yes, we died when Jesus died, but we also died when we became born-again believers. And so, we died with Christ that part, our union with Christ was accomplished on the cross 2,000 plus years ago. And it is personally applied to us as believers when we put our faith. That's how the text talks about it. And I'm not going to you know, go uh, give my own explanation or force an explanation. It talks about it as a past event. It talks about it as a present event. We died with Christ when he died and we died when we became believers. So if anybody was interested in that question, because I've not really heard it being addressed. Now we'll read verses 4 right up to verses 10, and I'm going to highlight a few important things. Let's read from verses 4 to verses 10. We were buried therefore with him. Buried is a seal of death. It, it shows the finality of death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, maybe your Bible says old man, it refers to the nature that is patterned after Adam. It doesn't refer, sometimes you think old man means my father or something. No, it means the old man, the Adamic nature within me. My old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. That is verses 2b to, I mean, sorry, verses 4 to 10. I just want to talk about the fact that if we are united to him in a death like his, in the likeness of his death, if we are united with him in his death, which is what the verse says, then verses 6 says that we have been crucified with him. We have been crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The Greek word here is the word keratharo, which means literally not complete annihilation, not complete destruction. A more accurate translation would say the body of sin has been rendered inoperative. It has been rendered powerless. It's like, you know, an electric appliance. When Jesus did what he did on the cross, he turned off the power supply. That's what it means. That's the imagery over here. He turned off the power supply. He said, this child... This son, this daughter is now out of business. He was working for you, Satan, but now he is out of business. She is out of business. She is my child. I have redeemed her or him by my blood. And so he says, out of business. He's rendered the body of sin inoperative. We received a new identity in him. Some of you might remember many years ago, the famous talk show host, Oprah Winfrey, went abroad. She went to some Swiss country. I can't remember which one it is. She went into this designer shop 
and she was looking at these really expensive handbags made out of crocodile leathers, black crocodile leather bag, which must have been about $38,000. And she asked the store clerk, can I, can I see that bag? And the store clerk looked at her and said, no, you can't. I don't think you can afford it. <laughs> she didn't know who she was talking to. She didn't know that Oprah Winfrey at that time was estimated. Her net worth was $1 billion. She could have definitely bought that handbag if she wanted to. It was a case of mistaken identity, maybe racism also, but it was a case of mistaken identity. She didn't know who she was talking to. Likewise, we have to remember our new identity in Christ. The body of sin has been crucified. It is important for us to know, because Paul begins by saying, do you not know? It's important for us to know. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. The psalmist says it a different way in Psalms 119, 11 says, I have hidden my word I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin. So we ought to know the word. The body of sin has been crucified with him. We have a new identity. Verse 7 says, For one who has died has been set free from sin. Imagine with me for a second that there's this notorious criminal. And he commits a heinous crime, a very serious, a very grave crime, where he kills a civilian. And the punishment, he's been handed over, the punishment for his crime, he's been handed over the death sentence. And he's going to die on an electric chair. Now if they carry out his execution on an electric chair and he's been put to death because of his crime of murdering somebody, once he's dead on the electric chair, he's paid the penalty. He's been justified of that crime. He's been set free of that crime because he's dead now. He's paid the, pun he, he, he's, you know, paid the punishment, he's bore the consequences. And therefore, he's been set free of that sin. That sin no longer has, that crime no longer has any hold or grasp on him. That's the thought in verses 7. For one who has died, if you've died, you've been set free from sin. Sin no longer has any hold, any grasp over any of us. Then if you go on, Paul talks about how if we've died with him, we'll also live with him. It's not only about the crucified life. The crucified life is important, but we need to ask, are you also living the resurrected life? Because the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us. And so we, because death can no longer have any dominion over Jesus, he lives to God now. The death that he died, he died once for sin. Now he lives to God. And so that is encouraging news. There's something known as the Stockholm Syndrome. I'm mentioning that because you might say all this sounds good in theory, but I still struggle with sin. Why do we still struggle with sin? Why does the old nature still tempt us? Why do we still sometimes give in to temptation and fall into sin? On the morning of August 23rd, 1973, a criminal, a convict, was crossing the street, crossing the road in the country of Sweden, in Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, which is Stockholm. And he entered a bank with a machine gun, and he shot the ceiling, and he imitated an American accent saying, the party has just begun. And he chased everybody out, and he held four hostages, all bank employees. And his demands, he had three demands. He wanted $700,000 in cash, he wanted a getaway car to escape, and he wanted his friend to be released from the prison. So three demands, all three demands were met by the police. They gave him the money, they, they gave him a blue Ford Mustang with a full tank of gas, and they released his friend also. But he said, I also want to take the hostages with me to ensure safe passage, to which the police said, no, you have to leave the hostages behind. They wanted the hostage. They said, we, you know, whatever demands you've made, we've met, you have to leave the hostages behind. And because of that, a 130 plus hour standoff ensued. He was hiding inside the bank. He took his four hostages into the bank vault. And he was hiding over there. During this time, on day two, day three, these people who were captured by him developed this strange bond with their captor. The strange attraction, they started liking, they started favoring, they started justifying his actions and his motives when they were speaking to other people. One lady said, her name was Christian Enmark, she said, when I was feeling cold, this guy, the criminal whose name was Olsen, came and put a wooden jacket on me. When I had a nightmare, he came and he comforted me. He even gave me a bullet for as a keepsake, as memorabilia, as a souvenir. So kind of him. Another lady said, when I was feeling claustrophobic inside the bowl, 
he tied my leg to a 30 foot rope and he let me take a stroll outside. I was so kind of him. Another lady was saying, I was trying to call home. I was trying to, I couldn't get through. And he said, don't worry, try again, try again. You eventually get through. He comforted me. Another man, the one male captor said, he was willing to shoot me in the leg. He didn't want to take my life. He was willing to shoot me in my leg and spare my life. And for some reason, they all started developing this bond with the captor. They, all, his, all his benevolent acts carried their sympathies. And so when they came out, when the police finally put tear gas and then rescued all of them, they were justifying. They said, please don't hurt them. Please take them slowly. They, no, they're not wrong and all that. And so that is the, the, the phenomenon came to be known as the Stockholm Syndrome. And it happens where the person who's being abused suddenly starts supporting the abuser. The person who's kidnapped supports the abductor. And this happens. And sometimes that's how it is with sin. Because we've li lived in sin so long, there's this strange bond that we've developed with sin. And that's why we continue to struggle with it. Many of you know of Jekyll and Hyde. Or maybe some of you have read the book where this person had a sort of like a dual personality. Two personalities in one person. It was a novel written by Robert Louis Stevenson, the Swedish author. When he was asked, when the author was asked, where did you get your inspiration to write a novel about a man with two personalities, Jekyll being a good man, and Hyde, Edward Hyde was this evil, malevolent man. Where did you get the inspiration? He said, I just had to look within. I just had to look within and I realized there were two conflicting natures, one good, one telling me to do good, and one telling me to do bad. And that's how it is with sin, isn't it? We sometimes feel that pull, that urge, and yet we have to overcome it. And knowing these wonderful truths, help us overcome it. Because sometimes we think that sin is dead long time since I committed that sin. But sometimes it has that ability. It's like when Jesus turned off the electrical appliance, we sometimes plug it back in because we remember. It comes back to life. We think it's dead. And we're not on our toes. We're not careful. But it comes back to life. I heard a preacher telling a story about the sports team from Italy going to Australia to participate in a sports competition. Because they were from Italy, or they had all these designers, and so one of the designers in Italy decided to give the whole sports team free jackets from Gucci. So they were wearing Gucci jackets and they were going to Australia to participate in the sports competition. So as before the sports competition, they wanted to see some kangaroos. So they went out into the outback, they went out into the countryside, and they were looking for kangaroos. As they were looking for kangaroos, by mistake, they hit one kangaroo across the in front of them, suddenly they hit the kangaroo, the kangaroo fell down. And so they decided to seize the opportunity. They thought, now the kangaroo is lying down, let's go take some pictures, putting our hands on the kangaroo. And they went outside, they put the jacket, the Gucci jacket on the kangaroo. And they decided to take a picture. Just when he clicked, suddenly the kangaroo came back to life and walked away and ran away with the Gucci jacket. In that Gucci jacket was the credit card of the team and the keys to the Land Rover that they got there. And so they were in trouble. They were not so. So somewhere today in Australia, there's a very fashionable kangaroo running around with a Gucci jack. So that's how sin is. Sometimes it comes back to life suddenly when you least expect it. Now, I want to leave us with the third point, which is the practical application which Paul gives us, which is adaptation. If uh, we read verses 11 onwards, uh, we'll see the application that Paul gives us. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So in verses 11, the thought over here is the word account. Because he says, so you must also consider. The Greek the word is logizomai, which means account. It's an accounting term. And he's saying in your ledger, consider yourself to be dead to sin. It's one thing to know it in theory, but it's one thing to believe it in the heart. And that's what's happening in verses 11. You know, you might know something, yes, Jesus, I died, I'm crucified with him. But to believe it in your heart, verses 11 says, you must also consider, you must also reckon, you must also believe, you must also account. So the thought is accounting yourselves dead. You must believe it in your heart. One preacher says it like this. 
He says to understand verses 11, you can take the example of a traditional conservative Jewish family. If one of the members, like say a son, decides to repudiate his faith in Judaism and becomes a Christian, he becomes born again, that Jewish father of the very conservative family will say, my son is dead to me. He's not physically dead, but he will consider him dead. He will cut off all ties with that son. That's what this verse means. We need to reckon, we need to count ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The second thought is one of adaptation. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. That verse itself tells us that there's a responsibility on our part. John Stott once said that sin is inevitable but it is never necessary. You might end up, you know, here and there making a mistake but it is never necessary especially according to 1 Corinthians 10 30 which says God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond you, what you can bear and he is always providing us with an escape route way of escape. So no sin, what he's accomplished us has empowered us to live a sin-free life. Even though sin is inevitable, it is never necessary according to John Stott. And so he said there's a personal element involved over here. Let not means I should not let, I shouldn't let sin reign in my mortal body and I should not obey its passions. It's something that I do with determination and with grit. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but grace, because if you're under law, the law only tells you what's wrong. It doesn't empower you like grace does. The law will say that's wrong, but then it doesn't give you any empowerment. But grace, as we saw over here in this passage, gives us that empowerment because we've been crucified with Christ. He's paid the price. That is his act of grace. I'll end with a story today about my mother because today is Mother's Day and so I thought maybe I'll end with a story about her. In 2011, she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and the reason she did it with 40 other women is to raise awareness for women who are being trafficked women who are being sold into the sex trade. And so in order to raise awareness, 40 women from all over the world, including herself, climbed scale Mount Kilimanjaro, which is in Tanzania. And the, and the mountain's about 19,000 feet high, snow, snow-capped mountains, and takes, a, it's a four-day trek. You can walk there and there'll be guides. And so when she got there, she didn't have the appropriate attire or the appropriate boots to climb this sort of a mountain. She just went there with her, you know, her usual walking shoes. And so somebody told her that we have to give you new attire. We need to dress you up in a very different way because the winds are going to be very chilly. Some of the ground is going to be very slippery. So you need specialized boots to climb to make your way up there. And they would go up, they would go higher than where they're going to camp. And then they would come below and then sleep there. That's called acclimatiz acclimatization. Where you go up a little higher so that your lungs get used to it and then you come back and you camp for the night below at a lower altitude. So they had to make all these adjustments. She had to make all these adjustments with getting the right attire because it was so cold, the right boots, the right gear, the right headgear to cover the ears and protect her, shield herself from the cold. And that's what I was thinking about as I read this because we are so used to submitting all our members. Our members means not the church members, but the parts of the body to unrighteousness. That's the life we lived according to that sinful nature. So many of our body parts we have used in sin before in our past life. So Paul is saying the most effective strategy for you to give up sin is to replace, is to adapt to this new life by now dedicating your hands and your feet and your mouth and your mind to doing the things of God, dedicated to righteousness. You have to make a change in our gear. We can't be clothed anymore with grave clothes, but we need to put on the grace clothes. We need to be clothed appropriately in the grace of Jesus with the identity that he gives us. And we need to fix our eyes on him. Many people talk about this example of how if you, if you have a trained dog and you have a treat for that dog, you might, you might be training the dog to say, wait, wait for the treat, right? And, and, and if it's a well-disciplined dog, it will wait for the treat. But when it's waiting for the treat, all the dog owners know this. When it's waiting for the treat, it won't be looking at the treat. It will be looking at your face. Because if it looks at the treat, it will get distracted. And that's how it is with sin. As long as we have our eyes fixed on the master, our God, our father, 
will not be tempted with sin. The intensity of sin will be loosened in our life. And that's what Paul is talking about over here. He's talking about our freedom from sin through union with Christ. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Loving, gracious Father, we thank you for this powerful passage, Lord Jesus, where we have been, those of us who have been baptized, have been baptized into your death. And because we died with you, because we are buried with you, you will also be raised to new life. We can walk in newness of life, Lord Jesus. We have resurrection power on the inside of us, Father. Help us in our battle with sin, Lord Jesus. Help us be victorious, Lord. All those areas of the flesh that have not been crucified, I pray, Father God, that we will think deeply about it, Lord Jesus. Like, a, like Spurgeon once said, grace that does not transform is not grace at all, Lord Jesus. So I pray that we will really, truly harness and leverage the grace that you've given to us, Lord Jesus. Use it to our advantage. Know that our identity in you has been changed, has been transformed. And we who have died to sin, how can we live in it anymore, Lord Jesus? I pray, Father God, that you would empower us, Lord. Give us the strength we need. Give us the conviction we need, Father God. So many of us are blind, Lord Jesus, and are only interested in pointing the faults of others, Lord Jesus. Forgive us for our judgmentalism over there, Father. I pray that we would look inward, look within, and focus on you, Lord, as that wonderful song says, and we sang yesterday as we fasted and prayed. Turn your eyes towards Jesus. Look full to his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Master, I pray that we will be able to look to you so that the things of earth, these temporary pleasures, these fading pleasures, these passing pleasures, will fade away, Lord, will lose its power, Lord Jesus. I pray that we will fix our eyes on you. Thank you for the salvation that we enjoy. Be with us this afternoon and evening, Lord Jesus. I pray for all the mothers. I pray that it will be a very special day for each one of them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.